JWST has been checking out an exoplanet once again, using spectroscopy to learn exactly what chemical elements and molecules make up its atmosphere. This isn't a pretty image like JWST normally produces, but rather it's a few fancy lines on a fancy graph. Scientifically, these are probably more exciting and more interesting than some of the images we've seen from the telescope, and reveals what this alien world is like in more detail than we've ever seen before. For the first time ever, we now have a detailed profile of the composition of an exo-atmosphere. Sure, JWST, Hubble and Spitzer have given us some spectra in the past, including of the planet we're visiting here, which is called WASP-39b, but never in this much detail. We've previously only been able to isolate individual elements, but here we have the full menu, even seeing fine details like clouds and isolated fluctuations across the planet. The exoplanet in question, WASP-39b, is about 700 light years away and is known as a hot Saturn, meaning it's about the same mass as Saturn, but orbits its star eight times closer than Mercury orbits our sun. So it's gonna be a pretty toasty planet. JWST had previously shown us a very obvious carbon dioxide feature in the atmosphere of WASP-39b, and these new observations should fill us with excitement that similar studies of planets more likely to host life than this one, yes, like the TRAPPIST-1 system, will also lead to incredible results. This is an absolute game changer. For this observation, JWST used three of its onboard instruments, NERCAM, which is a near-infrared camera, and NERIS and NERSPEC, which are both near-infrared spectrographs. NERCAM can also take spectra, and this plot it produced does show evidence of water in the atmosphere. It's likely in the form of water vapour because of how hot WASP-39b is, but the exciting, new, really juicy stuff comes from the other instruments. These produce more detailed spectra, because that's their main job. So let's dive on in. If you want to know about the details of how JWST actually takes spectra and uses light to determine what elements are in an atmosphere, I have a pretty cool video all about it, which I'll link up here and in the description, that goes into the details of the process and even shows you a super cool tabletop demonstration of it. You might have noticed that while I just said they used three instruments, there are actually four plots that we've seen. One is from NERCAM, one is from NERIS, and both of these down here are from NERSPEC. They look different even though they use the same instrument, because each of the instruments on JWST can be run in different modes, and here the team used two different modes to observe WASP-39b. I think that usually an observation of a target wouldn't use both of these modes, but as this was part of the early release science program for JWST, using both was part of a technology demonstration as well as part of the science. They wanted to show that both of them work. The difference between these two is that PRISM, this one here, is a broad mode. It essentially is a PRISM, as it lets us look at a large range of wavelengths of light, but at a lower resolution than some of the other modes. This one here comes from the G395H mode, which looks at a smaller range of wavelengths, but the data it takes is higher resolution. So we can say that the data here is a higher quality in the range that it can look at, but it's just a more limited range that it can actually see. Among the cool discoveries of the higher precision spectroscopy is that of sulfur dioxide, or SO2, in the atmosphere. This is cool because the molecule is produced by a chemical reaction caused by the high energy light from the star interacting with other elements in the atmosphere. On Earth, it was a similar process that gave us our protective ozone layer high in the atmosphere. We're now able to see radiation from the star changing the chemistry of an exoplanet in a similar way to how radiation and chemistry eventually led to the emergence of life on Earth. This planet isn't there yet, but it's still an exciting step. I should say, on these plots, each white circle is a data point where JWST detects a certain wavelength of light, and the blue line through them is just the best fit theoretical model that we have at the moment. Together, all of the white points give us the full spectrum of the planet and tell us all about the details of the atmosphere. This next plot is made by the same instrument as the one I just showed you, but just shows more wavelengths, so we're getting a more complete view here. You can see this bit right here is the same as the previous one, but at these shorter wavelengths, we can now see evidence of sodium and potassium too, as well as more evidence of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and water vapor as well. 
The potassium was seen in the NERIS spectrum, which covers the same range of wavelengths as this section of the NERSPEC data. But the potassium only seems to be visible in the NERIS spectrum. Across the spectrum, we're seeing things we've never seen before such as the sulfur dioxide and evidence of water vapour at longer wavelengths than we've ever been able to detect. The carbon dioxide evidence we have here is also way higher resolution than the evidence we've seen of it on this planet before. Here, we have twice as many data points compared to the previous observations. There were also interesting things missing from the spectrum that many people expected to see, such as methane and hydrogen sulfide. Personally, I can't tell you where they're hiding or why they aren't here. But if we hear any more from the JWST teams, then I'll be sure to update you right here on the channel. So make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, so you don't miss our future videos, including all of the JWST updates you could ever want. Now that we have such a detailed and intimate knowledge of what's going on in the atmosphere, we can do cool things like comparing the different abundances of each element, with common and useful comparisons being the carbon to oxygen and potassium to oxygen ratios. These can teach us things like how the planet formed, and here actually revealed to us that in the past, WASP-39b underwent some mergers, or at least some pretty hefty impacts, to acquire some of the heavier elements we're seeing. The large amount of oxygen compared to carbon also might suggest that the planet formed further out than it is now, and slowly migrated inwards, presumably to stay nice and warm. Finally, could we breathe on this planet now that we know what the atmosphere is made of? Well, no, you'd suffocate and you'd burn in the heat. Although I don't know which one would get you first. So let me know in the comments if you work that one out. Either way, I wouldn't book a holiday here anytime soon. Despite this exoplanet being pretty desolate for us mere humans, it's exciting to think about the other planets we can study in this same way. And we can expect to completely rewrite how we do exoplanet science. I'll throw some links to some interesting things about this exoplanet and the new data in the description below, including some cool Twitter threads that talk about it too. So if you want more, please get stuck into those. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.